Welcome to our Methodist Church of Sanctuary service. My name is Doug Baker, and I'm the lead pastor. Today, we continue our current sermon series, Margin, Creating Space to Breathe, Relate, and Give. It's also Commitment Sunday here at Marvin. Thank you for your generosity that provides for the Lord's work. Let's join in as the message is underway. But when everyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. It's the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Lord God, in these moments, as your word is proclaimed, I ask you to hide me behind the cross. Come, Holy Spirit, speak into our hearts. Very important message about giving attention to you. Lord, do we know in this world today, there is so much distraction, so many ways that we can be pulled off of what is really important in the moment, whether it's you, whether it's our loved ones, So I pray for each individual who hears these words from Scripture and my reflections upon them, that, Lord, you'll do a good work in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. John Mark Comer, in his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, has some very insightful reflections about our modern culture. He states that apprentices of Jesus, of which we all are, this in this sanctuary today, have as our main task to turn our mind's attention to God. He goes on to suggest that the modern world is a virtual conspiracy against the interior life, your soul. With all the distraction and all the information and all the culture and all the schemes of the devil, the distraction is to keep you from intending to the life with God that you have through Jesus Christ. Jesus stated in Matthew 6, 21, our hearts follow behind our treasures. And we'd be quick to say that our treasures are our wealth or maybe our time. But uh, John Mark Comer suggests that the greatest treasure for Americans today may be our attention. And let me tell you, there's a lot of people that want to get your attention. And there are pop-up ads all over the place, and there are all kinds of uh, information news feeds coming you and pinging your phone at all times because everybody wants your attention. And I'm here to remind you, friends, that God desires your attention as well, and that God desires your heart and your love and your adoration for Him as well. And through Jesus Christ, we have full access to God. There is no veil that no longer separates us. Because of the death of Jesus Christ, we have access to our Heavenly Father. And that is something that we should treasure and that we should cultivate in our lives. Today, we continue our sermon series called Margin, Creating Space to Breathe, to Relate, and to Give. We've talked about a margin of space in our schedules. We've talked about the margin of space in our wallets, just leaving room for God so that we can support God's purposes. Today, we're going to talk about being attentive to God and just how hard that is today in the world, especially in the world with the cell phone. Does your attention span have room in it enough for God to speak to you, whether it be through devotions, through this sermon this morning, through your uh, time of prayer, through uh, a prompting of the Spirit. Will you pay attention before the next news feed or the next ping on your phone for a text message from someone draws you into some other dialogue or some other place? Will you remember to act upon God's promptings if God asks you to do something? Or will you be drawn away by, again, an advertisement, a conversation, a notification, or just a simple message from a friend? The Internet has changed our lives. It has shortened our attention spans. Nicholas Carr's book, The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brain, states that the Internet is chipping away at our capacity not only to concentrate, but to contemplate, to think seriously and to go deep on things and issues. We'd rather just surf across the top or scroll along the headlines. Carr concludes, once I was a scuba diver in a sea of words, but now I zip along the surface like a guy on a jet ski. 
Matthew Crawford's book, The World Beyond Your Head, speaks of an insistent, unrelenting assault on the attention of people. Whether it's news or marketing or notifications, alerts, status updates, postings, it is an incessant barrage of information that is clamoring for your attention. One of the frightful things that Carr discovered in his research is that people are struggling to read an entire book from cover to cover in today's world. And more importantly, they're struggling to even make it through a long email or a long blog. They simply just want to hit the high points and read the first couple sentences and move on. The cell phone and the computer, though, may be quick, but friends, those that's making a difference on our brains. Our brains are adjusting to the quick way that we get information on the mobile device and are expecting to get that type of information all the time in those fast-paced ways, even in the way we relate to one another. In fact, one of the dangers of what I want us to hear this morning is if our attention spans continue to shrink, we will lose the capacity to be empathetic and be compassionate for others because that requires attention. That requires us to be locked in and engaged not only with the person that is in front of us, with whatever situation we may be dealing with, especially our relationship with God. We must pay attention to God and we must maybe train or retrain against the culture our attention spans so that we can be attentive and hear the Lord who speaks, not always as quickly as our news feeds do. God, give us attention. Lord, help us to give you attention that we may breathe and relate and give of our lives. Friends, I've read something even more uh, concerning lately is that because of the iPhone and what's begun to happen in year, recent years as they've tracked the attention spans of human beings is now that the human being's attention span in America is eight seconds. Now, one writer had some fun with this and compared to the attention span of a goldfish, which is nine seconds. <laughs> and I want to know, who did that research? <laughs> I mean, how do you do the research to find out what the attention span of a goldfish is? I, I don't know. I think it'd been easier to draw the lot to manage those who are human beings than a fish. But friends, this is what we want to talk about today. And our scripture certainly is giving us my outline for today. Whoever turns to the Lord, the veil is now taken away. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And in verse 18, we are to contemplate the Lord's glory. And in so doing, as we contemplate the Lord, we are being transformed into his image, his likeness. So that's where we're heading today. But let's talk about this veil for a minute. What is the backstory on the veil? In Exodus 34, 29 through 35, we hear of Moses coming down from Mount Sinai. He's got the Ten Commandments with him, and he's coming down to the Israelites. And, uh, you know, this is the second trip down because it wasn't so good when he came down the first time. But we won't go into that now. Talk about attention spans back then. Couldn't have been any better. But he'd been up there for 40 days and 40 nights with the Lord, and his face was a glow because of the radiance of God, which was now glowing on his face. The people were so afraid of Moses, he had to say, don't be afraid. You can come close. I bring to you a message of the Lord. And if you read the scripture very closely, Exodus 34, 29 through 35, you'll see that he kept his face a glow as he shared the news of the Ten Commandments. And it was afterwards that he put a veil over his face. Very interesting, and Paul is gonna make note of that, stating that he feels, he makes a theological point here, that the glow of the Lord was of the old covenant, and that was truly fading away, because now we know Christ. And because we have Christ, who lives in us, and the power of the Holy Spirit, our glow is a total different thing. It is nonstop, supposed to be with us all the time, right, church? But Moses had gotten into veil management, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. He was covering his face so the people wouldn't see or notice that his glow was fading. 
Just as a tan or something or a sunburn would kind of demise, go down, then so was the glow of God upon Moses as maybe hours or days passed since he'd been in the presence of the Lord. Maybe he was hearing from his friends. Maybe people were saying, hey, what's going on with you and God? The glow's not white it was yesterday, Moses. So he's getting so much feedback, whatever the reason, he starts to veil his face. Friends, that's just a good uh, reminder to all of us about how we can kind of have a secret relationship with God and no one really knows we're struggling. No one really knows we're suffering. We try to, you know, we're worried about what other people are thinking. We put on this image, but really what's, we're dying inside. The only way to fix that, I believe, is to turn to Jesus, to turn to the Lord, just as the Scripture says, because Christ now lives in us, and there is no longer a barrier, and the law is no longer an option. We have forgiveness for our mistakes. We don't have to keep the law. We, we strive to follow the laws of God, but we have forgiveness when we fall short. The perfect sacrificial lamb has been slain, and we come into Christ's presence at any time when we need him. We can call out to the Lord. We must turn to the Lord Many people in our church have taken the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality class by uh, Pastor Peter Scazzaro, and I want to just make mention of the great book that goes along with it. Gene and I did about a year ago. He talks about the daily office. Some of the Episcopalians in the church may recognize the terminology of the daily office. It's very old school. We simply call that today our daily devotions. But what Scazzaro does in his book is helpful. He says, our turning to the Lord is not to get something, hear this now, not to get something because that is why we scroll and that's why we're so quick on the internet. We want to get some information. We need something. We need to make a decision or we want to connect with somebody or we feel like we compulsively must respond to a text. But this is not about getting something. We turn to the Lord to be with someone to be with someone. And Scazzaro talks about the word office comes from the Latin word opus, which means work. We do a daily work with God, but it is not our work. The work is on the inference of God's work. We turn our hearts to God so that God can do his work of healing. God can do his work of reconciliation. God can do his work of patience or, or love, what he needs to bring into our lives. That's the work that is focused on here. And it was in 525 AD that St. Benedict, through his monasteries, began to write a daily order where he began to invite the monks to pray at the specific times during the day. This is something that even Jesus did, with pulling away early in the mornings, Daniel had his times of prayer. King David had times where he was in prayer. This is not a new idea, friends, for those who are God followers, but do you have a specific time that you turn to God every day that is your time with the Lord? That's what we want to focus on. That is the most important question. James Finley, in a book called Christian Meditation, Experience the Presence of God, gives some helpful pointers about what's important in our time with God. And the first thing he says is, be attentive, be attentive. Friends, I'm gonna just be honest with you, when the cell phone is around when I'm having devotions, it is a distraction. Inevitably, I'll be in the middle of studying God's word or doing something and the phone will send a message that either somebody's texting me or something else is going on that I need to respond to. And I've just had to make a decision that when I spend time with the Lord, if I'm gonna be attentive, the cell phone's gotta be in another place. And you know what? That's okay. It'll be okay. And I wanna encourage you with the spiritual discipline to set that phone in the other room and don't get caught up in this fear of knowing that, oh my gosh, if I don't respond immediately, they won't, they'll think I won't care. It's okay. Take a deep breath. Be still. Maybe change the, the way you sit, the change of the posture, but stay uh, uh, in a posture maybe of sitting or in a different posture than usual, but then breathe deeply. And I just want to share with you, Adam Kobach uh, shared our devotion for our administrative council meeting on Tuesday night, and he had us start with some, about a minute of silence and, and uh, breathing and following our breath. And let me tell you, it was probably one of the most delightful experiences that we've had, most spiritual moments of just, you know, just the leadership of the church just 
stopping and taking a breath together and reminded of God's presence with us and uh, that our breath is so important to our life with God. And so I just want to give him that shout out, but just to encourage you to be a part of your uh, stepping away in devotions as well, as well as silence. Now, here's two options for you. John Eldridge, a lot of his works talks about the one minute pause. The one minute pause can happen anytime during the day. Just take a stop for one minute and be silent. Scazzaro recommends we start our day with two minutes of silence. You might want to just try with one and see how hard it is and then see if you can go for two. But silence is where God often speaks, and then, of course, the reading of Scripture and our prayer. The Scriptures uh, are such a great thing. There's so many wonderful Bible reading plans here in the church right now, whether it's the gospel reading plan, the read through the Bible in a year plan, whether the reading of the Psalms. Uh, you maybe have your own reading plan, but the Scriptures is where God often will speak to us through His Holy Spirit and then making sure we have time for prayer as well. Our pastors, our staff will be willing to help in any way to help you have a devotional life, have a plan for your devotions, to give attention to your spiritual life as you turn yourself towards God daily if you don't already have a plan. You've got to have a plan and work that plan like anything or you'll have no plan at all. And I don't know about you, but there are days when I feel like I am a pinball in a pinball machine. Amen? Anybody have those kind of days? Any days? And I think I counted yesterday. I was dealing with two funerals I was trying to set up for our church members who passed away on Friday. And I had 24 text messages and phone calls all within about a three-hour span. And I kind of felt like I was bouncing around. We were trying to work logistics with everybody. All that's to say is you know what I'm talking about. It can get out of hand so I'm just saying this morning, this afternoon, it's a beautiful day. My phone is staying inside, and I'm going outside to the back patio, and I'm going to spend some time with the Lord to catch my breath and to have a Sabbath afternoon. And let me just say, that is what I want to suggest for us as well. So turning to God, however you do it, extended periods of time, short moments in the morning, maybe at lunch, maybe in the evening time as well as you set a pattern throughout the day to turn to God. And then secondly, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Moses seemed to get into this idea of wanting to know what uh, everyone was thinking about him and his glow and probably turned to his wife on many occasions and said, how's the glow look today, honey? <laughs> And she said, uh, keep wearing the veil, all right? So he became very religious about it, and I think he was missing the whole thing. I think, friends, the goodness of God can become very restrictive, very much rule-following, and we forget about the freedom of the Holy Spirit. I want to share with you a story that happened this past week. I was with the Marvin Menders on Thursday. They were doing their work at a, a woman named Linda's property in the Flint area, and uh, they were doing great work. And I thought I'd just go out there and, and uh, visit them with lunch, but I felt very strongly that I needed to go. And uh, I don't know why, I couldn't shake it, um, but I decided I was going to get out there, see Adam, see the Marvin Menders, and I had the opportunity to meet Linda. And I asked her, Linda, how can I pray for you? I'm the pastor of the church, one of the pastors of the church. She said, uh, she started tearing up. She said, uh, she said, there's some issues with my dog and, and that, you know, with all this going on, this construction plus his illness, I cannot have him in my home anymore. And anyway, without going into the whole story, uh, she had me to pray for herself and for her puppy dog. And uh, all I could say is that I prayed with her and then as soon as I got in my car, I called a veterinarian in the church to see because her main concern was she did not have the funds to take care of the dog's needs. Our great veterinarian in the church offered to do it for free. And friends, um, I thought I was going out there just to eat a taco and eat with, see the guys and encourage them in their work. But I think the Holy Spirit had another mission for me to do. And I think that uh, I involved another church member, and I think everything's worked out. And even after the 8.30 service, another person offered to help. And I told Gina that night, I said, it's the first time I ever prayed for a person and ended up helping the animal that she uh, is uh, keeping watch over. It's funny how the Holy Spirit works at times. But, you know, the Holy Spirit, hear this, is about helping the most people, helping the most people 
and using the most Christians as he can in one moment. And I think that was kind of, that happened that week uh, at, on Thursday. I'm grateful that God is not legalistic. I'm grateful that God doesn't say, I only do this so much, and after that I'll do what's only required of me, nothing more, nothing less. But we know God is free. And whenever our hearts turn to Him, God is ready to meet us, to heal us, to move in mysterious ways, and to even involve other people in His healing process. But friends, what if I hadn't been paying attention? What if I just decided on Thursday, I don't get this nagging feeling, I need to go out and see the menders, but I, I got other things I need to do. What if when I got out there and prayed for her, I really wasn't paying attention, I was just praying, going through the motions, but she mentioned the dog, but I'll let it go, it's just a dog, right? No, but something kept saying, help solve this problem, and then sure enough, our church member was able to step right in and help immediately. Friends, what if I wasn't listening? What if I wasn't paying attention? to the promptings. Well, last, let me just close with this. When we contemplate the Lord's glory, we're being transformed. Nicholas Carr again says in the book, The Shallows, concentration and contemplation are where we are suffering due to the internet and social media. To contemplate is to look thoroughly for a long time at something to give continued attention to it, to study it. Some of the richest, most peaceful, most beautiful moments have been in long time study of God's Word and in uninterrupted prayer. Again, because the cell phone was not in the room. How do you contemplate God's glory? As you read Scripture, maybe you get a big picture of God doing glorious things, or maybe you hear an answered prayer of a friend in a covenant group. And that's kind of where I want to end up this morning. I recently heard the story of a one of our young fathers in the church, a guy named Cade Crumbly. He's in my covenant group. He had a very stressful day at work. So stressful, so upsetting that he even used the word rage as he went home from the office to get home to be with his family. Cade had the awareness and the attention to know that emotionally he was not in a good place. So he told his wife, and he just, I've got to step away. I've got to go outside. I need to pray and talk this out with God. And so he went on a walk, and he cried out to God to deliver him and to help him with the struggle that he's having at the office. Well, the next day, he went to work. One of his employees approached him. She came in at noontime in the office, and she said, I, I need to show you something. Follow me to the break room. She says, this is very abnormal for me. I don't usually do these kind of things, but I just have to tell you, the Lord told me to make you a pie. And I, I don't understand it. I don't need to understand it, but the Lord told me to make you a pie. And so Kate opened the refrigerator, and it was a lemon icebox pie. It was his favorite pie. It was the pie that his mother used to make for him when he was upset and needed some comfort food. The amazing part about this story is his mother died seven years ago, and the woman had no clue about what his favorite pie was or about the story about how his mother made him pies. She just did what the Lord asked her to do. It's an amazing, beautiful story. But for a young man that's dealing with uh, work issues and pressures and having young kids and being married in this time, and uh, it was a sign from God that God heard his prayer. And in Cade's words, this is what the pie meant. God heard my cry for help that my mom is with God and there's an employee out there that cares about me. We never know how God will move. The prayer, that, yeah, the, the comment that Cade made yesterday to me is this, prayer is huge. If I will just do the Jesus thing and stop worrying, God will show up. Cade is being transformed, transformed and renewed in spirit. And that's what the word change in the Greek in that text means. It means to change after being with someone. 
He's being changed after being with God. I close with one of my favorite poems from Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Aurora Lee. Earth is crammed with heaven and every common bush of fire with God, but only the one who sees takes off their shoes. The rest sit around and pluck blackberries. I like to rewrite it a little bit. The earth is crammed with heaven, every common bush of fire with God, but only the one who takes off their shoes will see. The rest will sit around and pluck their blackberries. Do you remember? 1999, the blackberry was born, and it brought email to your phone, and you could no longer get away from the office because now your emails were following you wherever you went and you could be in immediately response with anybody and available at all times. For friends, that was 1999 and in 2007, the iPhone took it up to another level. With every improvement it's made with the touch screen, it has revolutionized our world, it has changed the world, much like the printing press did in 1436. How are you gonna respond? Your attention is under attack. Will you make time to turn to the Lord, to be restored, renewed, and healed? Will you set the cell phone aside and just listen for Jesus and worship him? Will you walk in the freedom of the Holy Spirit and the freedom and the promptings that the Spirit gives? And will you be transformed to be more like Jesus? Because friends, that's what the church's ministry is all about. We're on a journey. We're on a journey to be like Jesus. And the only way to do that is a long obedience in the same direction, attentive to the one we are trying to become. Amen? Let's stay the course and continue with the mission. Amen. Thank you for watching our broadcast this morning. I'd like to personally invite you to join us for Sunday morning worship services at 8.30, 11 on our campus in downtown Tyler, Texas. I hope you'll visit our website to learn more about our church and ways that you can partner with us to make a difference for God's kingdom here in Tyler and around the world. Contributions can be made to the church through our QR code now seen on the screen or by sending a check to the church. May God bless you and may you have a great day.